eastern part of India. And uh, we are a manufacturer of rescue boats. So our mission uh, this afternoon is to sell a rescue boat to the fire service of uh, Tamil Nadu in Chennai. And so um, go along with me and uh, we'll see how we as European manufacturers can close a deal in India. When we travel to India, we are dealing with uh, many different uh, people, different uh, normally larger groups and from different uh, backgrounds. So um, specifically about India, you'll get a presentation later in this series by Divya Susan. I would like to talk about conducting meetings and negotiating in countries, Asian countries, Latin American countries, and uh, other countries in the world outside of Europe. In order to prepare for a meeting, it's important to understand that we have cultural differences to deal with. In a past uh, presentation of uh, Egbert Schramm, you have seen the different dimensions of uh, culture, the Hofstede dimensions. I will spend uh, a few moments on explaining those because if you're not aware of the cultural differences there, you might find this big elephant in the room, the elephant of culture when you're dealing with uh, people of other countries and you're negotiating, you're trying to reach a deal, you might find things turning in a different way than you had expected. And yeah, things are different as we uh, often expect them to be. We do not see the things as they are, and we see them as we are. So we must be aware of the fact that the other person from a different culture is as much um, foreign to us as vice versa. And uh, we have to understand that a person we are dealing with might see things completely different than us, that their values of negotiating, of dealing with business is different than ours. So that's what I would like to discuss this afternoon in the few um, minutes we have. We have a uh, little over half an hour. And uh, I'll try to uh, guide you through a few factors of uh, conducting a negotiation. Now, to understand another culture better, we have to understand ourselves first. Uh, us as Europeans, we differ in uh, different ways from other cultures. Uh, only in the European Union, we can already distinguish different profiles, cultural profiles. Uh, Eastern Europe, for example, Central Europe, Northern Europe, and Anglo-Saxon Europe and Latin Europe have different cultural profiles. So people that represent these profiles can expect, can expect to differ in different ways from other cultures than others do. If I, being a Dutch person, for example, travel to Tamil Nadu in India, <clears throat> my cultural differences, my perceptions of how the Indian counterpart is dealing uh, with the meeting might be different than somebody, for example, from Portugal. The differences are, are um, maybe less from the Portuguese perspective or from the German perspective or Eastern European perspective. If we take, um, if we review the uh, steps that Egbert Schramm has taken in the previous webinar, we remember to have seen six uh, basic dilemmas, how people deal with authority, how the relationship of an individual is to the group, how the role of the individual is uh, to the group, the way people deal with uncertainty and ambiguity, the way people perceive the future and the way people celebrate life. These are important basic social dilemmas that we all deal with in our own societies. And when we have meetings with people from different cultures, we run into different perceptions of, for example, authority of the way people act within a group. 
if we look at the host data dimensions very briefly, and I recommend you to look at the webinar of last time to review these again, we see six different dimensions, of which four are more important in negotiations. The first one is power distance, uh, the extent to which less powerful members of an ins institutions and organizations within a country can accept that power is distributed unequally. Uh, we see uh, big differences in how power distance applies in certain cultures. In Northern Europe, for example, to your, the left of this uh, graph, is quite egalitarian. And for example, Latin uh, Europe, but also Latin America, Russia, and Asian countries, Arab countries, are, have a much higher power distance. And this is a significant aspect in uh, negotiations. I'll come back to that in a moment on the effects of, uh, of these dimensions. If we look at the second dimension, uh, individualism, we see th th that this is the degree of independence a society maintains amongst its members. And you can distinguish between collectivistic countries to the left and individualistic cultures to the right. So again, to the right, Anglo-Saxon and Northern European cultures being quite individualistic, Latin Europe, Central Europe being modestly individualistic, and then this cluster of Asian countries, Arab, Russia, China, but also uh, Latin America, Turkey, um, and uh, Japan being quite collectivistic. Russia has mentioned twice, it should have been a different uh, country, obviously. But um, you see the distinction between European countries and more collectivistic countries. And I'll show you in a moment how those um, cultural differences apply in negotiations. A um, little bit more complex dimension is masculinity. And uh, this is the dimension where motivation comes into play, being more masculine or feminine. And we see a uh, high masculine society, Japan, and uh, Northern Europe being a feminine society, and the other countries uh, in between. In uh, negotiations, uh, we can distinguish masculinity in certain ways as well, which I'll show you in a moment. A fourth dimension, which is important in negotiations and conducting meetings is uncertainty avoidance, the extent to which the members of a culture feel threatened by ambiguous or unknown situations and have created beliefs and institutions that try to avoid these. So you have uh, cultures that have a tendency to avoid uncertainty more like Japan, Russia, Latin Europe, Latin America, and uh, less like Northern Europe, China, and Anglo-Saxon Saxon countries, with the Netherlands and Central Europe sitting in the middle. And here in this example, for example, you can see that from the perspective of, of Latin European cultures, the difference with Latin America, but also Arab countries and Asian countries is much less than, uh, for example, for Northern European countries. China, okay. uh, interestingly enough, um, has a tendency of low uncertainty avoidance. Now, in order to um, deal with this cultural elephant when we have meetings, the Americans have a great expression, slice the elephant. We can uh, sort of organize ourselves in our thinking and prepare for the meeting and understand the dynamics of the negotiations we are facing when we travel to Tamil Nadu and when we sit with our counterparts of the fire service in India. Uh, let's imagine this table where we sit with uh, four people attending the meeting. Normally there are many more, but this is just uh, the graphic. And you see different sections here. And the first uh, um, uh, important aspect is, it's like a Chinese turntable, are nine factors 
which are important in meetings. We can distinguish the aim of the meeting, persons, style, communication, time, emotions, ethics, risk, and contract. Those are nine important factors which we have to deal with when we conduct meetings in any country within our own culture, obviously, but also outside of our own culture. These nine factors are influenced by culture. So in the outer circle of this Chinese turning table, you can see the different power, the different dimensions. So power distance, individualism, and um, result orientation, which is a different way of explaining masculinity, which I'll do in a moment. Uncertainty avoidance, long-term orientation, and hedonism. The last two uh, dimensions I did not mention uh, previously because of our time restriction, first of all, but also because these aspects have uh, a little less influence on negotiations as the other dimensions. Now let, let's go into a little bit more detail. Uh, Rohit and Subroto. Rohit and Subroto are, are our counterparts in, uh, in the meeting in Tamil Nadu. Now, uh, Subroto is a person who is very well trained. He has a lot of technical expertise and um, you can expect him to understand the issue that we came all the way from Europe to discuss with him at the technical quality of our rescue vessel. Uh, Rohit is a person who is not that well trained, but he is very well connected into the municipality of Chennai and into the fire service. So Rohit and Subroto are, are our counterparts. And, um, and this brings me to the first element in the negotiation, negotiation table or in the meeting table, uh, which is the persons. We have to understand with whom we are dealing and not only the names and their positions, but we also need to understand where they come from in a broad sense. So we can understand that Rohit has relationships and he will probably be an important factor in influencing people that might be final decision makers. Uh, whilst Subroto is much more, has a lot of technical expertise and Subroto might be able to share what we really want to convey to the table, the quality of our equipment versus quality from other competitors. So this is an element that we need to understand and also see the differences between uh, where we come from ourselves. If we come from, for example, where the Netherlands, uh, the relationship issue is much less important than the ex expert level. Uh, same thing in Central Europe. In other countries, the uh, relationship aspect is more important than the expertise for decision making. So those aspects are important to understand. Um, when we have um, understood uh, which persons we deal with, where they come from, what their backgrounds are, we can look at the next step, which is the rituals and the way people deal with each other and what motivates them. Uh, this is a picture in, taken in another Asian countries where the um, relationships are very important, where certain rituals are important, where it's important to share uh, friendship and also to uh, trust each other. And that brings me to the second aspect of the negotiations, which is style. The way people deal with negotiating, uh, is it a distributive style or a more integrative style? Distributive being the winner takes it all, winning and losing, or an integrative style being uh, consensus seeking and making sure that we all get the best out of a deal yeah? and uh, more distributive styles lead to confrontation whilst integrative styles are a more uh, friendly style. So it's important if you travel to an, another culture to 
understand what you could expect aside from people's personalities, etc. But what people are used to in terms of negotiation. Sometimes, uh, like if you travel to the United States, it's quite normal that you enter into confrontations and that people win, others lose, and they have to wait for their turn. In uh, Northern Europe, for example, people tend to seek consensus and to make sure uh, that there's a win-win situation. So uh, style, style is an important element in, uh, in negotiations and getting a deal. The next step is communication. Communication, of course, like uh, everybody that works uh, internationally and with other cultures, is one of the most important aspects of dealing with uh, intercultural situations. In communications, we are looking at high context and low context communications, indirect or direct communications, and closed versus transparent. Now in the, uh, the last uh, issue means that people might have information or might not have information. The power distance, for example, influences here in communication because people might prefer to sit on information rather than sharing it freely with subordinates. And so Subroto might have information on the technical aspects, but he is not easily willing to share it with others. And whilst you might be expecting from your cultural perspective that everybody that you're dealing with has the same information, that might not be the case. So you have to find out who has information at the same level as you have, or who has information that you need to conclude a deal in an effective way. Uh, the other aspect of uh, high context and low context communication is where people are quite direct and where the contents of what people say is basically what you get, what you hear is what you get, in contrast to high context communication where the context is equally important as the words that are being said. Some, in some cultures, what is not being said is even more important than, than what is being actually said in words. So you have to be quite alert in high context communication cultures of what is not being said, how the body language is, <clears throat> how certain signs are, if people rephrase, come back on issues, say yes, and they mean, in fact, they mean a, a no without saying it. All those aspects are extremely important to understand and to be, be prepared for before drawing any conclusions. Um, low and high context, here you can see different countries, uh, US being extremely low context and Japan being very high context. And this picture is quite uh, famous with Mr. Trump being a very extreme low context communicator and Mr. Macron being a relatively high context communicator when they shook hands, Trump simply wanted to show his power and, and sh shake the hand of Macron. Macron held Trump's hand and kept it there. And there was a lot of symbolism and a lot of nonverbal communication in his handshake, which he later vented out, of course, in the media. So high context, low context communication and understanding the issues with these uh, aspects of communication is extremely important in negotiations. And this is uh, a graph that uh, shows uh, how the dimensions influence communications, uncertainty, avoidance, and power distance, and the different styles that people prefer in countries, cultures, to use. And if you take, for example, the quadrant to your left upper hand, uh, exacting style is important. It's important to provide data and to show you're right, uh, why is your product the best product? Uh, whilst uh, in the uh, right upper quadrant, people communicate in a more elaborate style with a lot of metaphors and a lot of words. The uh, form is more important than the content. And um, 
And in the lower quadrants, when we look at, uh, at India, sometimes silences are important. And then I would like to give uh, you a hint here with the word wait. Wait being the abbreviation of what am I talking? Listen. Sometimes it's better not to say anything or to repeat what was last said rather than making your point and losing the opportunity to get more information, information that you might not get when you speak too quickly. Um, one aspect in modern life with high context and low context communication is that when you have low context communication, it's more easy to have virtual meetings. Uh, sometimes it's uh, more cost effective and easier and quicker to rather use Skype or like we do today, use uh, WebEx to negotiate or to communicate or to share information with other cultures. And that's fine between uh, low context co communicators. However, in high context communicating cultures, these virtual methods are more difficult and it's more difficult to get the message across, but especially to understand what your counterpart is actually thinking. So in terms of our mission of this afternoon, it's better to travel to Chennai and to build up relationships with the local counterpart than use Skype, Webex or Zoom or the telephone or even the email. The same thing applies over the email. You always need to communicate virtually, but the results you get by meeting people in person. And um, this graph you will find in, in the handout later on. But this is, uh, are all the aspects that come into play when you have virtual meetings. Culture is important, uh, but also the way the team is set up, the way people, uh, the, the configuration of the meeting, who is there in the room, the virtual room, uh, the technology, the leadership, all these aspects come into play. It's not just picking up the phone or setting up a WebEx meeting. Now, when we sit in Tamil Nadu in Chennai and we are discussing with Subroto and Rohit, and we finally are reaching a certain result in terms of getting information or having them start accepting that your product is apparently one of the better in the market or your price is uh, maybe a little bit more expensive, but uh, you have reasons for that and that they would be doing a good deal. Then the boss arrives because the boss likes to meet your, the foreign visitor. And that's when the whole meeting is completely set uh, upside down. You have to go outside and the whole fire brigade joins you in taking a, a picture and you sit next to this fire chief and another person and most of them you don't know what they do or what they mean to you in terms of uh, your negotiation. But still, you have to go along with it, of course, because that's how people in India prefer to uh, welcome their visitors. But your time frame was planned, you, you were plan planning to be in Chennai today, and tomorrow you had a new uh, meeting in, in Delhi, and then you were traveling to Mumbai. So um, this is where time comes into play. Time is an important factor in negotiations. Uh, the way in most countries in Europe we deal with time is different than in other cultures. Of course, uh, in Latin Europe there are examples of people dealing in a different way with time as in Northern Europe, but the differences can be quite significant in countries like uh, India. So punctuality is different, flexibility in time is different, and people are po polychronic. Monochronic is when we complete our task, we go from one task to the other, we have an agenda, we move forward uh, towards a goal in polychronic situation, polychronic cultures, it might be completely different. It could be that this chief uh, reaching the fire service at four o'clock in the afternoon for the picture simply takes you away from the meeting 
and nobody dares say anything because he's the chief and takes you for dinner, which by the fact is, uh, by the way, is great because probably this chief is going to be the uh, decision maker anyway. So it's a fantastic opportunity, but don't plan to go to Delhi the next day. You have to build in more time to reach your objectives. In my um, experience, I always have called this swimming pool time. If I plan for a foreign visit, I always build in uh, swimming pool time, which means that it allows to go and sit at the swimming pool if you simply reach your goal, but, mu but you rarely actually sit at the swimming pool because you need your time to build the relationship, build trust, uh, get back to this meeting, go back to Rohit and Subroto uh, because the chief has taken you away the previous day. So time is an important aspect. Now, with um, another aspect, emotions, we see different things that uh, happen uh, during meetings or negotiations, especially if there's more than one meeting and uh, if a relationship uh, needs to be built up or if things get a little bit uh, rougher, if the confrontational style is used, then aspects like receiving or giving face become important. In collectivistic cultures, um, face, face saving, face is an important issue, much more than in certain uh, European countries or Anglo-Saxon uh, countries. Um, you receive face by, for example, meeting this fire chief of Chennai, or for example, like here in this particular picture, meeting the Turkish uh, leader, and you, re you receive face, and then a lot of people within your um, sphere of influence to get your deal will be much more responsive to what you're saying because you got face of the big chief. The same way you can also give face and you have to pay attention to that. Like in this uh, per, uh, particular situation when I went to negotiate in China, my uh, counterpart is a gentleman sitting uh, to the left or to the right of me in the left person on the picture. And um, he simply wanted to show off with this foreign visitor coming all the way from the Netherlands to this relatively re remote city in China. And I spent a few hours sort of being displayed in this way, but giving face to my host, which was an important aspect to dedicate my time to. And then after giving face to my host, it was much easier to negotiate with him and come to to quite uh, good terms together. Um, the way people look at uh, shame and guilt differs from one culture to the other. A more individualistic culture has uh, emotion that tends more towards guilt. It's something that you find within yourself in I cultures. In we cultures, more collectivistic cultures, uh, we deal with uh, people have, have more shame if, if there's wrongdoing or if people are sort of called to attention in, in, in a group, then people feel shame. They feel shame towards the group. Or uh, if people are late in meetings or um, something that they could have prevented, then the, a more individualistic person feels guilt. So guilt and shame are two different um, emotions seemingly about the same issue, but they are they are lived through in a different way, and it's important to understand these emotions. So in meetings and negotiations, emotions become important, especially when the meeting doesn't go your way and you have uh, uh, to push a little bit harder to get results, and then uh, you have to recognize the difference in the way people have emotions. Of course, we are all humans. We all have basic similar emotions, but the way they are dealt with and also um, dealt with publicly is different. So people have open emotions or much more subdued and they have more inner stress, inner stress or they are more relaxed about confrontation. 
Um, I'll skip uh, ethics because of uh, time uh, restrictions. Uh, ethics is a very complex uh, subject and uh, we might get an opportunity later on in QWIN to discuss this particular aspect of uh, negotiations. Um, but uh, risk, risk taking is an important factor. You might remember that I discussed in the beginning of this webinar uncertainty avoidance and uh, cultures that uh, are, have a tendency to avoid uncertainty are also less risk prone. It does not really mean that they do not drive fast when they sit in a car or they do not jump a fence, things like that. It's not that type of risk, but people that uh, are uncertain um, tend to avoid uncertainty are very uh, susceptible to, for example, having uh, manuals or having spec specifications or dealing with the expert. And so, for example, in the case of Subroto and Rohit, if you travel alone, with ha which happens a lot when you're a small or a medium enterprise, you are basically the person that represents all these aspects, uh, the, the technical, the commercial, the administrative, Sometimes you can afford to travel in a team. And if you can, then it's important to understand how do people un uh, deal with uncertainty. If it's an uncertainty avoidant culture you're traveling to, then it's um, important and it could be a good idea to bring an expert with you. Even if you have all the expertise, an expert with not, well, he shouldn't basically sit in a white coat or anything, but he can be the technical director or the lab person or whatever to show expertise and take away uncertainty with your counterpart. Um, so uh, some cultures are much more focused on expertise and having certainty about quality of products. Other cultures are more open to innovation. And uh, I, in my uh, experience, I feel that uh, China is one of those countries where China is always, uh, Chinese are uh, normally quite open to new technology, to be a launching customer. Uh, imagine that our, our uh, rescue boat uh, would have a new engine or new materials. And uh, then I would find it quite, uh, quite more easy in, for example, China, to bring uh, new technology and to have them uh, test it and maybe even uh, copy it. You have to be careful with that, of course. But um, then uh, they are much more open to innovation than other cultures. So uh, that's the, uh, the eighth uh, factor in this uh, nine factors. And then the last one, the last one is uh, also dealing with uh, the initial one, which was the aim of the meeting. When we travel to Chennai, in our minds, we say, okay, when we go back to Europe, we have sold so many boats. That's the aim of our um, meeting, of our trip, our mission. We want a contract. But that's not always the case with our counterparts. They might be seeking a relationship. They might be much more longer term oriented than us. So we have to be aware of those differences and also appreciate those differences and build the relationship and still trying to get our contract, obviously. The contract itself might be different. Some cultures like to have a very big contract with a lot of small letters. You can imagine countries that are high on uncertainty avoidance. They want a very uh, complete uh, contract with all the things uh, discussed and pointed out. Uh, other cultures are much more open to just mentioning the principles and uh, trusting that during the implementation of a contract things uh, will be um, organized in, a, in the way they think uh, would be best. Those cultures are often also very oriented towards building trust and relationships. You spend a lot of time building up a relationship, building trust, and then the principles of a contract might be enough. In fact, if you come with a very thick contract with many, many, many clauses and details, then they might be even offended. So 
they might say, well, you don't trust me. Why don't you trust me? Why do you come with this incredible contract? And uh, there's another element to this, which is having a fixed uh, contract and what you uh, agree upon, that's it. That's what you work on and, and there's no, uh, no other, um, let's say, alternative than this. But other cultures are more open to progressive insight. And of course, the Dutch are famous for that. We always keep on discussing opening contracts and changing our minds and making sure that everybody contributes. So that's the difference. Some cultures are open to progressive insight and change as uh, new insights present themselves. And other cultures prefer to simply fix the deal and that's, uh, that's it, work along those lines. So now you have the complete uh, Chinese turning table, nine fa factors, which uh, hopefully will help you conclude the negotiations in China, uh, sorry, in Chennai in a successful way with uh, Rohit being happy, with his boss being happy, probably with all the way up to the mayor being happy, but also Subroto and his men, uh, which are actually the technical people and the users of the product. So in different levels, you deal in a different way with different people. And here you can see the uh, overview of the nine factors and the different aspects. It's, of course, just a summary of many aspects that come into play. But the objective of this uh, webinar today was to show you how to prepare for meetings and conclude it successfully by slicing the elephant and distinguishing the different elements of negotiations. Thank you for your attention and we are, the floor is open for questions. So, any questions? Okay, maybe I can, um, uh, I had a question before uh, actually starting the webinar uh, of somebody that uh, contacted me telling that uh, she wasn't able to attend. Uh, the question that she posed was that uh, what to do um, if the person that you're dealing with, and uh, Rohit and Subrot in our case, uh, and maybe in, in this case Rohit, does not actually does not have a mandate. It's very difficult to find out that the person does not have a mandate. But when you eventually find out, and again here, it's important to take your time, um, that uh, the person does not have a mandate. And that's where it's important to help Rohit create um, a, a sort of a story, uh, motivation, set up uh, his talk to the person that actually takes a decision. If you can reach that person in a friendly way by having dinner with him, then that's of course an opportunity, but you don't want to overstep uh, Rohit and you have to respect his position, but you have to help him by providing as much information as you can so he can convince his boss. Uh, let me see what, what other, uh, how do we do if someone doesn't respect the contract? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good, very good uh, question. Um, my uh, personal experience in uh, international business is that uh, um, there's normally um, good reason to deviate from the contract. You have to distinguish between not respecting the contract or deviating from the contract. Um, sometimes progressive insights help us to improve on uh, the situation. And I think it's uh, if, with an open mind, you can uh, change the, uh, the, the contract and the way uh, you work uh, together. Um, if people simply uh, not respect the contract and do not want to enter into any business with you by uh, neglecting the contract, then it's important to establish that as early as possible without having spent the money. And then, of course, you end up in a situation 
to consider fighting uh, in the judicial system of the country that you did the deal in or to let it go. Sometimes it's wiser to let it go, but trust and relationship is perhaps the most important aspect in this whole uh, negotiation. And by building trust and the relationship and by making the right choices of with whom to build the trust and the relationship, you uh, hope not to end up in this uh, situation. Uh, another question here is, uh, is it easy to adjust your style of negotiation? And uh, there, there are two aspects uh, to this. First of all, your own uh, style. Um, you're, you're, you have your own comfort zone. If you come from a culture that is integrative um, and more feminine culture where you prefer to have a win-win uh, situation and where people have their say, and it's not necessarily the winner takes it all, that, then that is your comfort zone. But if you are in a different culture and you are confronted with confrontation and people are simply trying to uh, get more out of it than you can uh, get out of it, and you sometimes uh, you, people end up pulling your leg or, or trying to get your price down as much as you can, then uh, you are sort of taken out of your comfort uh, zone. And uh, experience learns that, yes, you can change your style, and it's best to change your style. Uh, but you always have to be authentic, try to be uh, authentic. What I, what I did, if people try to push me too hard on price, um, then uh, and even confront me with it uh, by simply leaving meetings and not answering my uh, request for a next meeting, things like that, then I would... Uh, go along with uh, lowering the price, but put something uh, in, con uh, in return for it. So I would lower a price, but then I would uh, not give a training, for example, or uh, extend the delivery time or things like that. Um, so that it would still not mean just giving into the confrontation. Um, another question here, do you have practical tips on how to recognize the type of person, style, etc. Well, the, the tips, uh, maybe three aspects. Of course, experience is uh, very important. Uh, the other aspect is uh, just what we've been doing uh, this afternoon, uh, understanding uh, cultural differences. Uh, I see uh, Stan Zegel uh, probably is a Dutch person asking this question. Uh, I can recommend my book, uh, Stan, uh, because um, uh, working from the Dutch perspective and prepare for meetings uh, abroad. Do we have a deal? But um, in general, preparing for the meetings uh, and not assuming that uh, every person that you will be meeting is a typical Indian person or responding in a certain way as is um, uh, uh, accepted to be normal in a certain culture, but, it, but at least anticipate, uh, anticipate the probability that the person reacts the way that fits a certain culture. And what is important also is, is um, our persons by themselves or in a group. In a group, in collectivistic cultures, the, the group effect is, of course, quite strong. And then cultural issues tend to emerge more, much stronger than when you deal with the person on an individual basis. So that, that's an important uh, uh, aspect uh, as well. Okay, any other, um, oh, and then maybe a last remark here, time. Spend time with a person uh, in, uh, in particular in collectivistic uh, cultures, spend time with the person, build trust, and then you, you will find out quite uh, soon if you're savvy enough uh, to uh, understand other people and other cultures, how somebody would normally be reacting in, uh, in negotiations. Um, another question, if you uh, take a look at the whole bandwidth of negotiation styles, can one say that people from completely different countries but similar cultures will do business more easily? For example, uh, hierarchy, Russia and China and uh, yeah. Okay, that's, uh, that's a very good uh, question. Um, 
the interesting thing here, and we are all uh, Europeans, is that uh, in Europe itself, we already differ quite a bit uh, in uh, culturally speaking. Um, so my experience is that, yes, within, for example, uh, Latin American countries, you can expect Latin Americans um, yeah, to negotiate more easily between their cultures, their cultural differences, but not as big as between, for example, uh, let's take Northern Europe and Latin America, there are differences. And then uh, we get organizational culture and personalities to become much more important and also professional cultures. Uh, so the way organizations are uh, organized, the values of an organization, the uh, professional culture, uh, for example, if we take again the example of Chennai, people of an ambulance service, uh, which is uh, an well, ambulance service or a fire service, they have a different professional culture. So within the culture, these aspects uh, come into play. And of course, we always have uh, uh, personalities uh, we are dealing with. Uh, so. Um, yeah, uh, we should, uh, let's say summarizing your question, uh, can one say that uh, from different uh, countries it's more easy um, or more difficult? Uh, it's more it's more difficult if uh, if you take somebody from uh, take uh, let's say Denmark going to India. Yes, more difficult than somebody from Russia going to China. Uh, Russian people can be expected to value relationship, trust building, a more collectivistic approach, and even a more confrontational style, uh, much more than somebody from uh, Denmark. Another question. Um, are there some tendencies related to particular values, characteristics regarding the price and deadline negotiation with our counterparts from other cultures. This is to overestimate cost or time needed to complete the product or underestimate. Okay, that's, uh, that's a, a, a good question and um, there's a few angles uh, uh, to this. Um, pri price is always an issue which in distri distributive cultures is becomes more important if you allow if you're let's say from an if you're from an integrative culture it goes against against your comfort to take this as a starting issue but in a more confrontational or distributive styles uh, price is often taken as the thing to talk about that that's where you can win and you and you can lose so uh, the uh, yeah, the issue is to try to get away as much as you can from from price. But I have experienced a lot that price is always taken as the stick to fight with. And if need be, you can fight back with it, but not giving in on price and discounts, but simply taking away something of your proposal rather than giving a discount. And let me see the last part you say uh, to uh, overestimate cost or time needed to complete. Yes, there, there's uh, sometimes a tendency, if I understand your question uh, uh, properly here, but it's, it's a good uh, remark anyways, that uh, if you push for results and uh, you uh, sort of uh, overestimate the delivery time or the, the costing, things like that in a deal, then uh, it depends on the contract you will have and it depends in culturally speaking also how sensitive cult people might be to, for example, uncertainty. Uh, with uncertainty avoiding cultures, the tendency is to, to create a lot of um, um, clauses to avoid uncertainty and it's better not to run into overestimating quality issues, delivery issues, uh, costing issues, uh, th those type of things, and, and be as open as possible to it because you will end up with problems. Uh, if it's people are uh, less prone to avoiding 
uncertainty, then it's also more easy to keep certain things open and uh, suggest that you aim for a certain delivery like you were asking here. Uh, uh, and, um, and, and create a working situation to complete a, um, a deal. But of course, if you sell a boat, that's it. You have a boat and that's it. If you build a building or a, uh, a factory, then it's a different, uh, a different type of deal, obviously. There's much more room to keep it open to, uh, to changes. Okay, so I'll take a last question if there's one. Uh, if not, we'll conclude this, uh, this webinar. Okay, no, uh, no questions then. Thank you very much uh, for participating. And um, we hope to see you back in uh, Cubin. I wish you a lot of uh, success with your business in other countries and see you another time. Thank you very much.